Our house stood quite alone, and these tall firs and beeches were not planted. Snakes and efts swarmed in the summer days, and nightly bats would fly about our bedrooms. Heath croppers lived on the hills, and were our only friends, so wild it was when first we settled there. It was a long, low cottage with a hipped roof of thatch, having dormer windows breaking up into the eaves, a chimney standing in the middle of the ridge, and another at each end. Hello, come in, come in and draw up to the phone. No, never mind your shoes. I'm glad you stepped up at last. Susan? Run down to Grandma Kites and see if you can borrow some larger candles in these four teams. This is the room where Thomas Hardy was born in 1840. And in this room, sitting at a tiny table and writing in notebooks, the 30-year-old Hardy began to write a story based on the world he knew best the social life and musical memories of his family and friends. He called it Under the Greenwood Tree. On a cold and starry Christmas Eve within living memory, a man was passing up a lane towards Melstock Cross. Hear the rosebuds in June and the violets in full blue. <laughs> On Christmas Eve, the musicians of the Meldstock Choir meet at Tranta Dewey's house to prepare for the night's carol singing, which they call Going the Rounds. Oi! Oi! Is that the young Dick Dewey? Aye, sure. Well, why not stop for fellow craters? Going to thy father's house and knowing us so well? Hello, my sonnies. I was just coming out the gate to work for thee. Oh, what a nice warm fire there, Mrs. Dewey. Oh, thank you oh, very much. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dewey. Oh, here, Mr. Penny, you sit in this chair. And how's your daughter, Mrs. Brown, John? Oh, I suppose I must say fair, but, well, she'll be worse before she's better. Oh, that's good, yes. Thomas Hardy's father and grandfather were builders and masons. The garden of the house was a builder's yard then, with gravel pits for aggregate close by. In Under the Greenwood Tree, Grandfather James is a mason, but the Dewey family are not really the Hardys. The Tranter is most likely based on one of the original members of the Melstock Choir, James Dart. Reuben? Don't you make such a mess of tapping that barrel as is mostly made in this house. Such a squizzling, squirting job as tis in your hands. I tap a hundred without wasting as much as you do with one. I, I know you tap a hundred beautiful hand. Perhaps two hundred. <laughs> Young Thomas sat around this fireplace and listened. He listened to the stories that his mother and grandmother told of times past. Smugglers, Napoleon, witches and cunning men. He learnt the songs and music of his family and friends. He walked down the track to the village school and later walked every day to and from Dorchester to school and to work. A deep sense of place and the inherited folk culture of his upbringing pervades under the greenwood tree. Damn this hole in the cask and some lordson too. Good cider should be wasted like this. Lend me a thumb, Michael! Lend me a thumb. I must find a bigger tap, me sonny. Father, here's the barrel tap, and we're all waiting. 
Our soul, oh, so yeah, <laughs> Michael and Joseph and John and you two, Dave. Ah, Merry Christmas to you. Merry, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. By 1872, the countryside was experiencing huge change from mechanisation, agricultural depression, social unrest, and the coming of the railways. The society Hardy remembered so fondly in Under the Greenwood Tree had already disappeared. The arrival of a new vicar, Mr Maybold, and the replacement of the village choir with the church organ is a small but potent symbol of the change. First thing Mr Maybold done when he come here was to be hot and strong about church business. Sure, that were the first thing he done. The next thing he to do is to think about altering the church. Sure, that were the next thing he done. Right. The next thing was to tell all the young chaps that on no account were they to be putting their hats in the christening font during service. Sure. Then, twas this, then that, now this. Aye, and now it's to turn us out of choir, neck and crop. <laughs> Whatever next. It must be owned he's not all there. It's far below the old vicar. I see that violins are good, and that an organ is good, and that when we introduce the organ it will not be that fiddles were bad, but that an organ was better. That you'll clearly understand, Dewey. Better try over number 78, I suppose. Ah, with all my heart. One, two, three. Thomas Hardy treasured the family music books, handwritten manuscripts containing carols and sacred music in the front, and songs and country dance tunes in the back, reflecting the two sides of the musician's repertoire. Hardy himself often played for dancing. No other novelist understood the joys and difficulties of community music making so well. Well done, boys. Number 78 always was a teaser, always. I mind him ever since I was growing up, a hard boy chap. Ah, it's a good tune and worth a mint of practice. Aye, <laughs> uh, is that. Though I've been mad with that tune, it's only good when I seize it and tear it on the linen. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's a good carol. There's no denying that. Aye, aye, aye. With the music practised and the singers arrived, the choir set off on their rounds. You two counter boys. Keep your ears open to Michael's fingering and don't he go straight into the trouble part as he did last year. Billy Chimney? Yes, sir. Don't he sing so raving mad as you would fain do? And all of you, whatever you do, keep your feet from making a great scuffle upon the path when we go in through people's gates. But go quietly so that we strike up all of a sudden like spirits.
noon tomorrow night, and mind, don't leave thy fiddle bag behind. We'll shake a leg and drink a cup of ale to keep Ward Christmas up. Thank you, Mike. The following evening, the Dewey's held a Christmas party and invited the neighbours in, including Farmer Shiner and Fancy Day. <laughs> Hardy describes the party as taking place in the parlour of the cottage that he knew so well. But perhaps he consciously, or unconsciously, exaggerated the size of the room. Is it possible to dance the triumph in here? No, Dick, I cannot. I really cannot have any dancing until Christmas Day is out. When the clock is done striking twelve, dance as much as you like. Well, have you ever seen a tailor as undone as I'm undone? With me watch and me breeches, and they've all gone. They've all gone away and they call me a blooming flower. <laughs> Ere I get my britches back, I dance again no more. No more, no more, no more, my boys, no more. And if ever I get my britches back, I dance again no more. The clock struck twelve and Dick appeared ready primed and the instruments were boldly handled. Old William very readily taking down the bass vial and touching the strings as irreligiously as could be desired. Fancy was now held so closely that Dick and she were practically one person. The room became to Dick like a picture in a dream. All that he could remember of it afterwards being the look of the fiddlers going to sleep as humming tops sleep by increasing their motion and hum. This cottage and the landscape around it was the inspiration for Thomas Hardy's early novels. His family were all ordinary working people, and yet from them, from their stories, their music, their sayings, their lives, and from his own fertile imagination, he created unforgettable tales. I like a party very well, once in a while, but Lord, tis such a sight of heavy work next day. What with the dirty plates and dust and smother and bits kicked off your furniture? Why, a body could almost wish there were no such things as Christmases. Anne, you may as well go in the bed. I'm not quite there and making such sleepy faces. It is true. I'll do the door and draw up the clock. You go in. Otherwise you'll be as white as a sheet tomorrow. Good night, y'all.